the first version was without uh, this introduction, but I this I, I was thinking I need a, a short part that will explain everything, no, very quickly. So I, I introduced this Leonardo da Vinci Sam's in the beginning, um, just the day before the release, essentially. And um, well, my idea was uh, let's start with the big picture. So let's see all the data set in a few seconds, and. Uh, I don't know, from some point of view, you can think, well, if you reveal everything in the beginning, after the audience will not follow the rest of the video. But I love start always with a big picture and after going detail, because I think the picture it will clarify the, like, the content of something, like an abstract in the paper, and after you go deeply to see you know, the consequence of choosing this uh, type of data set to explore the history of uh, knowledge. Of, uh, so the concept is very simple, let's see important people that really influence our um, life in terms of what we are thinking, what technology we are using, what paint we are like, uh, to see why we go to Louvre. And so all the reason that, uh, cultural reason that change our spirit, if you want. And so um, this is a beautiful data set that comes from Google. Is a Free based data you know, database, and um, uh, they talk about essentially European and American culture. So there is a, a Frank Sinatra, there is a John Travolta, there is a uh, there are all the collection of Italian Pope, uh, but um, and uh, um, so, uh, Leonardo da Vinci and so on. Um, but there are no many important artists that come from Africa, of Asia, other area. So, but it's enough uh, just to understand maybe European culture, American culture. So, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this is a, a way to transform uh, uh, these people in a, like a sensor to identify uh, why some city uh, becomes so huge. Uh, now we are looking like uh, uh, French with this big red dot is Paris, and uh, uh, and I think it's very clear Germany on the right uh, with so many uh, red and blue dots. Uh, I was mean that uh, Paris uh, is like uh, the La Mecca for all the people that are looking for art and culture in uh, in, in French, but in in uh, in Germany. Uh, was um, this, the cultural situation was different. If he was a poet, a painter, um, many position in many uh, city was available for you to really express yourself. So uh, was no um, this a hub uh, phenomena. And this is, I think, something that emerged very easily from this video. Understanding in different country um, if uh, there is some uh, city hub or not. Of the, is there a really important cultural center or not? And after this, this um, jump to the new continent. So it's clear that this come in the middle of the video. It's clear that the sound in some way changed, become a little bit more uh, intense and this bit because this, this is a big event in our history, in, in, in history of. Uh, uh, European culture, they now become European American culture, and uh, uh, slowly there are uh, important people, important writers that decide to, uh, no, to have a new life in US. So uh, in the New England, uh, so it's clear from the name New England, there is a there are city like Cambridge. They just are like a copy and paste in the beginning of the city from England. So um, the, the name of the street, the name of the place. Um, so it was a, for sure was a, this first time was a full of a, a nostalgic behavior, for sure. And so you see all at the beginning all these red dots that now become blue dot, and this is a very important event in the sense that now uh, uh, there are a new age. Uh, the future writer that really will change America, the future songwriter, the future architect, the politician, um, military people that will, will change the history of US, now are born in US. And you see slowly there is a, this uh, conquest from, uh, uh, from European to all the American country. So from the one side there is a drama in this picture, so the uh, Indian culture disappear. And from the other side, there is uh, this interest in, uh, uh, for example, new highlight that now emerged. So you see all this sequence of that, they move fast, crazy faster to uh, um, Los Angeles. And why there are so many people that move? Because now there is a, a train available, airplane available, car available. So it's more easy to move from one coast to another. So in the same times, uh, all these uh, dots that move from one city to another represent the evolution of the technical evolution. Uh, in the history. 
Uh, and now a little zoom. So Los Angeles is no more a place where to go. Uh, the Florida, and it sounds a little bit strange. Florida is a place where there are museums and it's important for what cultural point of view. You know, in reality, um, some way, um, the meaning of this red dot represents different things. In the beginning, you know, it really represents important city where to go. Uh, because um, uh, you want to go to Rome to become famous, to Paris to become famous. But uh, uh, after the invention of train and airplane, uh, the red dot have a little bit different meaning because maybe you want to die where you, where is your mom, no? Or where is a good weather, where is a, uh, where you can have a very uh, um, a quiet uh, uh, no, life uh, now that you are very old. So this is the reason why uh, area like Florida or in Europe, area like the south of French become so popular. Um, no, I think uh, uh, when you watch this video, you just you see the evolution of uh, uh, the cultural uh, in Europe and in America, and especially. But in the same times, you see the the way that uh, uh, innovation in technique, so you now moving from horse to airplane to you know, car and, and train uh, change our uh, the distance and the way that we can select now where we want to die. Um, so uh, I, um, five minutes is very short time to really describe so many intense events that happen. So you see uh, something, but probably 0.1% uh, of all the story that is inside this data set and would be a very uh, challenging and time consuming try to go deep inside to this uh, video and really discover why something happened. In the beginning, it's very clear when there is this picture and this big overview, so essentially you see, um, it's the only time that, uh, where you see clearly all the data set, except at the end, but in the end is very quickly, um, that emerge clearly this, uh, uh, this point here in the middle. And there is nothing there. Uh, there is no island, there is nothing. So uh, many friends ask me, oh, oh, is a mistake in the data set? What's going on? No, it's not a mistake. It's, a, our, it's our decision, essentially, to find, uh, in a poetic way, a location to identify of the people that die in this challenge to move from Europe to US, to America. So there are so many uh, artists that, unfortunately, they never uh, realize the dream to see America. And they died in the, during the trip. And that, right, so the location, of course, is just ocean, no, Atlantic or, or whatever, um, um, Pacific or Atlantic. So there are the two dots that represent this uh, sad event of... Uh, so we, we decided to put all together in the same dot, in the same location, because I think it's a, a poetic way to remember all this person. Google. My name is Elijah Meeks. I live in the Bay Area. When I was working on the Orbis project, I was the Digital Humanities Specialist and then later the lead developer for the Center for Interdisciplinary Digital Research at Stanford University Library. My areas of specialty are GIS, uh, web mapping, network analysis, and the production of interactive scholarly publications. Orbis is the Stanford Geospatial Network Model of the Roman World. It was designed to simulate the transportation of goods and the movement of people in the Roman world, broadly speaking. Uh, the, the Roman world as it was maximally uh, extent, it was never the size that it was as simulated in the model. Uh, it achieves that by, by simulating land travel and the cost of shipping goods on land or on river or on sea according to Diocletian's edict. Um, sea travel is speeds are based on simulated sea travel. Movement speeds on rivers are based on schematic uh, rates of travel on the rivers. Orbis was implemented to better understand the movement of peoples, and therefore the shape of the Roman world in the eyes of historical actors. So we think of uh, state systems to be the kinds of modern state systems that we look at on maps that are built on uh, modern understandings of, of space and geography. And we understand territory in a way that uh, early peoples didn't. Early peoples understood a territory that they were embedded in, 
that was the, the shape of the world that they were in was based on priority, it was based on time of year, uh, it was based on their location within a network. So Orbis reflects this in that certain parts of the network are more or less accessible based on time of year. They're more or less accessible based on whether or not you're trying to move people there or ship goods there. They're more or less accessible based on whether you are starting out in one part of the system and trying to get to a different part of the system as opposed to starting out at the center of the system and trying to get to uh, perhaps one of the, the semi-periphery areas. Orbis is one of the most robust web mapping applications available right now because it takes advantage of exotic geospatial information visualization techniques that you don't typically see deployed in web maps, uh, like Voronoi tessellation or dynamic distance cartograms. Orbis is also unique in that it's been extremely popular not only in the scholarly community, and not only in the classics and historical community, but also in other scholarly communities. It's been used by climate scientists to better understand climate change during the Roman period. And it's also been very popular among the public. Orbis has been featured in articles in traditional print publications, and it's also been featured on popular internet websites like Ars Technica and Reddit. To query the Orbis model, you access the online mapping interface, and depending on the level of resolution of your query, you might select the Route tab, the Network tab, or the Flow tab. To explore the cost in time or money to move from one location to another in the Orbis model, in the Route tab, you simply select a single location in the From field, and another location in the To field, and click Calculate Route. Here we can see the fastest route from London to Rome. We could contrast that with the cheapest route from London to Rome, which emphasizes the incredible difference in the cost to ship goods overseas as compared to shipping goods over land. We could also change the time of year, either via season or specific month, to access the changes in wind conditions and uh, sea travel availability based on heavy seas that the model simulates and calculate a new route and we'll see that there is a different cheapest route between London and Rome during the winter than there is during the summer. By exploring routes in this way you can explore the contingent relationship between two points in the Orbis system and therefore two points in the Roman world system. You can see how London due to its access to coastal shipping is during the summer part of the connected Roman core, but during the winter much farther away from the Roman center than other sites in the Mediterranean that might be less far in traditional as the crow flies distance. If you're interested in the effect of different times of year and different priorities and different perspectives on the shape of the Roman world, then you can use the network queries by clicking on the network tab. And instead of selecting a source and a target for a route, you select a center, you could select Rome. And as with the routes, you select a priority. You can select a direction of the travel. You can turn on or off certain network options and then calculate the network distance for the entire Orbis model from a particular or to a particular center. Here we can see the cost in time from Rome to the rest of the Roman world. We can represent that either by coloring the paths to reflect the cost or by leveraging Voronoi polygons to represent that cost as a territory or by utilizing distance cartograms to distort the Roman network to reflect the cost based on the actual measured straight line distance from Rome to various sites. A distance cartogram maintains the angle of a point or the points that make up the routes that are represented using geospatial data objects like polylines, while distorting the distance. So Taraco, for instance, is the same angle from Rome, but its distance now reflects its relative time network cost to reach Taraco 
from Rome. Because we're able to measure the distance from or to any sites in the Roman world to a particular center, because we're able to calculate those centers, and because we're able to calculate multiple centers, then Orbis can leverage this capability to split the Roman world into clusters based on the distance from a site to a particular center in the calculations that you've run. That clustering also includes a frontier tolerance so that you can designate any sites that if the cost to reach one of these centers is very close to the cost to reach another center, it's within that tolerance setting, then those sites will be labeled as frontier regions. The clustering results color the sites based on the nearest center or whether they're in a frontier region. We can also use the same zones feature to show those regions territorially. So here we see the Roman world split into sites that are closer to Rome, Constantinople, Jerusalem, or London, closer defined by our query as being in the cost to ship kilogram of wheat in the summer, as well as sites in a dark blue that are within a similar cost to reach two or more centers. Orbis also provides the capacity to export the results of your work as SVG or as high resolution PNG of the various network diagrams and flows and routes that you might have calculated. The interactive interface into the Orbis model can be accessed at orbis.stanford.edu. Static snapshots of the model can also be downloaded from the Stanford Digital Repository. I hope you enjoy using Orbis, whether you're trying to further understand the movement of peoples in the classical world, or you're just using it for fun. Hi, I'm Sam Mills, and I did the original interface design and graphic support for Academy Scope. And I work with the team of programmers here and our partners at NAS to make this visualization as fun, informative, and easy to use as possible. And one of the ways we accomplished that was by color coding the topics. As you can see in the menu here, each topic has its own color that is the same whether you're in the bar graph, in the network graph, the topic icon, or the menu. And this not only makes the visualization more fun to look at and play with, it also makes it easier to keep track of where you are. Another feature we added that we think um, not only is informative but also makes the, the piece fun to play with is the main topic uh, graph. Uh, each one of these shiny spheres represents a subtopic and you can move these around, you can bang them into each other. It's, it's fun just to look at and play with but it's also informative because each of these uh, spheres is sized based on the number of, uh, the number of publications in each subtopic. So if you take a look at this graph, you can easily see that public health and prevention has the most publications inside of it. And when you go inside of a subtopic, you get a temporal graph down here that shows you the number of publications by year from 1995 all the way to present day. So for example, if I go to internet and networking, I can see that 1997 and 2003 had the most publications in it. Now let's click on 1997, highlights this uh, bar in the graph, and it also enlarges and outlines each of the publications that was uh, published in that year. So it's easy to get an idea of what was published when, just by scrolling through this graph. And when I select a single book, I get a detail here, a nice large cover image. Um, I get the release date, the number of downloads, uh, and a brief synopsis of the text, which I can expand if I want to read more. And this gives me the full abstract. And then we also added a feature down here that uh, allows you to go to related publications. So if I'm on Toward a Safer and More Secure Cyberspace, I can see the related books here in the, in the large network graph. They're also down here, so I can quickly 
get to a related book. And then if I want to go back to the book I was on, just click this large orange button here that says return to previous book. Another nice feature we added are the zoom buttons. And this allows you to zoom into a particular spot in the graph. And you can use your fingers to move the graph around. And this makes it really easy to find uh, a particular book if you're looking for it, or just to get an idea of the relationships between these books um, in a more detailed way. One feature we added to the visualization that we think uh, will help users is the tutorial panel down here. Now this has four separate panels showing you how to navigate each area of the visualization. Here we have an explanation of uh, automatic mode, which is what you see when you first walk up. This is uh, the publication is being downloaded now around the world. And when one is downloaded, you get a little pop-up that shows you the, the number of downloads based on the current one. Oh, we've got one right here. So our goal was to make Academy Scope equally informative and fun to use. We want people who know the subject matter and may have even written some of it uh, to get a lot out of this, to be able to uh, look at these network graphs and, and actually learn something. And we also want the general public to get something out of this. Um, even people that don't have an interest in these topics or have limited knowledge uh, can find something of interest in here, uh, or at least start to learn w what the popular topics in science are now and how they've evolved over time. Hi, I'm Adam Simpson. I'm one of the developers who worked on the Academy Scope visualization. I worked with one other full-time developer and three part-time developers to make this visualization work. Uh, we used approximately three months to get this up and running from uh, start to the finished product. Um, some of the technologies we use, this is entirely web-based. We're using a JavaScript library called d3.js. D3 stands for Data-Driven Documents. It's a really great um, web library to make really nice visualizations um, like we've produced here. We're using Firefox 17.0.1. We found that this was the best browser. It suited all of our needs. We've done extensive testing on all of the browsers. Uh, we found that Google Chrome had the best JavaScript performance, but it had a lot of issues with interactivity and touching. Um, Internet Explorer was also fairly quick with the JavaScript, but it also had uh, touch limitations and we had a lot of problems with the dragging. And most other major browsers we tried didn't even support SVG objects yet since it's still a fairly new um, technology. We're running this machine on Windows 8 right now. We found that the improved touch drivers for Windows 8 really helped us get a smoother experience for the touching and dragging effects. And um, we actually noticed that it looked a lot better due to the improved graphics rendering uh, on Windows 8. Here we have a force layout, which is native D3.js function. Uh, it allows us to take nodes and edges and dynamically insert them into our visualization. As you can see, we kind of have this heartbeat effect going on right now. And it contracts and repulses the nodes. We wanted to do this for two reasons. The main reason being we wanted to attract the user to come up and play with the visualization and show them that it could be a lot of fun, but we also wanted to have constant movement to prevent screen burning. When you're in this mode, which is activated after 10 minutes of inactivity, you can touch anywhere on the screen to bring up the actual visualization. If we switch over to interactive mode with the toggle button down here, we can also see our uh, custom bar graph implementation. The bar graph at the bottom is using pure SVG objects. We wanted to use uh, SVG objects and transitions with CSS styling. This allows us to reallocate some of the uh, processor power to other parts of the visualization that need it to increase performance. So over here on the right, we have the navigation panel. This is all built off of jQuery. Uh, we, we built our own function and used the swiping, hide, and show functions of jQuery to make this um, work pretty smoothly with uh, just you know touch interaction. At the bottom, we have this toggle switch, which is also built on jQuery. Um, it's really quick, really easy to use, pretty fluid. Touching one of these top topics will bring up the bubble visualization. Um, the bubble visualization also uses the force layout in D3, uh, minus the actual link constraints. So you just have these bubbles that aren't connected, but you can still drag them around. So from here, you can either choose to select a category or touch a bubble, and it will take you to the same visualization depending on the network you've chosen. Our ultimate goal here was to create a user interface that was intuitive to any user of any experience level. Uh, we did this by taking hints from uh, smartphone and tablet technologies that allow you to touch on anything you see and interact with any element of any page.
tried it actually and I had been making um, diagrams and timelines that's the uh, consistent thing in most of my work um, is that it usually has kind of a left to right relationship with time and uh, so I've been making a few of those and someone in in your curatorial outreach group um, have must have seen something and some of them are on the internet um, but also I'm in the same gallery I'm an artist a working mm -hmm. artist and I my work isn't really made for the scientific communities that made through the public and it finds its way out through galleries and art mm -hmm. venues and things like that and another artist was a, a commissioned by places and spaces to do a diagram um, that uh, Kathy Berner had in mind which was a kind of a genealogy of science showing kind of the how an idea comes out and then he did this little sort of brain thing and he, he works for the same gallery and she may have stumbled across my work okay. at that time so when they were in they were sending out invitations to get more interest in people applying and so I sent um, so anyways they reached me so I, I responded and um, the piece that I sent which was this I, I sent actually a couple of pieces but this one um, the ones that I sent were actually not made specifically for the Places and Spaces exhibit. They were things that I'd actually already done. Okay. And and this one, um, and I believe the iteration that was happening there was, I think, number seven, and it was about libraries. Right, in a way. right, visual interfaces. So it, I just thought, well, this piece that, that I have right here is um, about a genre of fiction. So that was a pretty close fit. And I think that it, uh, it appealed to them and to the to the judges and the curators enough that it was um, included. And uh, this was um, you know, based really on the fact that, that I look for subjects to to diagram or map, and mm -hmm. and ones that I think other people might be interested in as well. Mm -hmm. And I think the first map I made was a kind of autobiographical. I mean, literally my autobiography mm -hmm. and. And that had some interest just by the fact that I was a human being and other people are human beings so they can r relate to the, to the ideas. But very often I find that, it, that I go at specific subjects and it taps into a people who have a, an abiding interest in that idea, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, most of my things originally started, the, the, the initial ideas I worked with were art related because I was showing in art centers and art people had that, that in common. But then I just let some of my more eccentric interests um, draw me into other directions. And science fiction has been an interest of mine since I was a kid. Okay. So, and I'm I'm a reader, and uh, and so I had so and and I and I had this idea of um, doing something that had a kind of a bio form in science fiction, just because of the monsters and things like that. So this this diagram. Um, it, it doesn't follow the, the strict Cartesian grid of the left to right x y axis. Mm -hmm. um, it sort of swirls through it. So it was uh, that was my sort of creative uh, notion is to bump out and, and and so that the tentacles of this sort of monster become uh, kind of channels back into time. And um, and I I so it was a matter of just doing research mm -hmm. and. Uh, and getting um, most of the things that other people have written. But, but the interesting thing about science fiction is that there's no shortage of opinions and they're easily accessible and people tend to do things like, here's 100 best books, you know, and that group will publish and there's a lot of competing ideas. So in this thing, I didn't want it to be, uh, the, the research is, has a, you know, just sort of a general, um, there's no real scientific method to it, mm -hmm. but, um, but it was still a kind of polling of what I could find, you know. So I read a couple of, of authoritative histories, mm -hmm. but uh, but also I I wanted to have specific titles and names, and I did want to have the hundred best books. And so I found mo more and more that this was pretty easy. Um, I could find at least four or five different uh, uh, authoritative groups or people who at least claimed to have an opinion, uh, and um, just sort of. Put it together in a big database and then take the top, you know, ones that I could fit. And um, so, if what eventually, I mean, you have the the earlier people talk about um, like the beginnings of science fiction. It actually doesn't really start until you have 
science. Mm -hmm. You can't have science fiction, they have science. But there are things that are related to science fiction that go way back to mythology and fantastic stories, and we've always had those things. So I started creating through my own, um, I started connecting those back, picking the, the ones that I thought were most important. You know, like there's the story of the Golem, which is in the Bible, or I'm not sure it's actually in the Bible, but it comes from um, Judaic uh, storytelling. And, uh, and it's this kind of almost like a Frankenstein monster, except for that it's different. But it's, it's there, so that's a, a kind of a prefiguring of Frankenstein, and Frankenstein is important because it's considered by experts to be the first science fiction novel. And, um, you know, so I can go into more details about this. I'll just briefly mention it. Um, the idea of, the, of science fiction, or even all genre fictions, which are um, the things that most people think of as like paperback books and things that people like to read, come out of a storytelling tradition um, that's fairly recent. Um, it's Gothic fiction, which is, you know, these <clears throat> exciting stories that have this arc of intrigue and maybe some violence or some. There's a kind of a, they have a kind of a problem that they solve, and there's kind of a resolution in some kind of way, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a, it's really 200 years old. The, the whole tradition mm -hmm. prior to that stories didn't have that same kind of satisfying arc out of the storyteller that we expect that movies are based on and most paperback novels and, and things like that. And the genres of fiction hadn't been settled; they were kind of found during the 19th century, and that would be coming out of the Gothic age, and these were things like Dracula was the story, it was a, an early Gothic novel, and uh, um, and they were they were connected to, you know, Shelley, um, the, the Frankenstein was written by Harriet Shelley, her husband was a romantic poet, and, and in fact the Gothic tradition kind of comes out of the feelings of the romantic movement. And, and this, so this this kind of gives a, kind mm -hmm. of a, a genealogy where you trace it back and you can see the roots that is actually connected into the deeper aspects of our culture. And so the idea of these tentacles are they're a little, a little bit like roots and they pass through this cloud of science and they go back into things like um, mythology. Um, and what people like Campbell will say is the kind of the sources of mythology, which is this kind of wonderment about the world and fear, apprehension about the world. and and so that's what these things go back. And then as they come through and they, we develop these, um, the, the, the kind of uh, industrial and middle class and leisure time and things like that, that where fiction has a, has a place in people's lives, science fiction kind of blooms out. And other forms of fiction like westerns and detective stories and horror mm -hmm. stories have also formed at that time romantic novels. And they kind of, in this thing, they go off into a different, because this is really about science fiction. And then we just mm -hmm. march through the various periods of time and and um, that's pretty well documented you know that's uh, and most science fiction people you know go know about Jules Verne and then um, the, the pulps and H.G. Wells and then the magazines come out Campbell and and uh, um, Hugo and um, Gernsback and eventually uh, people like Asimov and and there and Asimov actually had it's art like this where you don't have to have a kind of a real strict methodology like a science fiction. You need to keep your apples in in, in order, and you can't toss in any oranges. Mm -hmm. But a diagram like mine, which is more like telling a story, I throw in something. So this just this random things, and so you have stuff like um, Asimov, who is a very analytical. He's, he's kind of a scientist himself. Uh, wrote, at least wrote scientific journalist stuff. He divided uh, science fiction into, into periods of uh, of, uh, of what they were interested in, what they were actually trying to do. Starting off with the with the sort of rockets and ray guns mm -hmm. thing, which is what most people immediately think of as science fiction, which goes towards the Buck Rogers idea, right? Mm -hmm. But really, pretty soon, it, this 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 that that was really kind of an adventure storytelling, and it really much more like the Gothic novels. But science fiction moves into this investigation of possible things that comes out of seriously trying to put what we know about science and what, what we, you know, and, and storytelling and then what was coming down the road. Mm -hmm. And the, so it becomes speculative in that kind of way. And, and so that they, they go through um, the science dominant period, which would be mm -hmm. from the mid thirties to the 
fifties, and then you go into this period of uh, of uh, psychology and sociology. This would be like the period of of um, a Twilight Zone and things like that, where it's not it's not rockets and ray guns anymore. It's kind of weird, kind of changes that in humans that have come into our awareness because of the, the science that we have, as opposed to the science um, reflecting off of the planets. And then you move into a, a period of time where it's really more about the literary forms, about how people write, mm -hmm. which is like the 60s. And you have different kinds of writers. And then, then they restart this sort of hard science, science fiction stuff. And that's kind of, you know, got where we are over the period of time now. You've got the branching genre of cyberpunk, mm -hmm. punk, right. things like that. The sort of base of the soup uh, happens on a level of this of not 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 a not a kind of methodical thinking, but just sort of like letting things come in and, and cook on that kind of back burner where you don't really know what's going on. Um, but as the ideas begin to be clarified, um, I start using large pieces of paper and making sketches of of the ideas and. Uh, there might, I might go into it with the idea of like, wow, I really ought to do something with this that's different than the last thing I did mm -hmm. because uh, they're all getting kind of boring looking the same. So let me make something based on a monster or a different, you know, I wanted to have a morphology. I've done a few pieces where I use some kind of body form or something drawn that becomes metaphors. You know, the, the earliest diagrams that are of this kind are from using a tree, you know, it's mm -hmm. like a family tree diagram coming and starting quite some time ago with, um, they used to, a, made a geolo genealogical tree for um, Jesus. It would connect um, King David to oh. Mary. And uh, it was, a, and it was, but the idea was that you have a tree and a tree is a, a form that everybody understands. It's branching, we know it has a root and it goes somewhere. So you're using this as kind of a metaphor for the movement of time and the, well, inheritance, connectivity, you know, mm -hmm. it, uh, where something comes out of another. That's really the idea. And a tree, the branch comes out of the trunk, comes out of the root, comes out of the earth. So this is a, a good metaphor for inheritance, for evolution, for um, the progress of an idea. So that was the idea is that if you have that metaphorical form, it becomes an organizing principle that conveys a lot of information that people already know to help them understand what you're trying to tell them, right? That, that's the idea, is that you use something that you need, you can't start from scratch, you need to use things that people already understand in order to tell them things that they don't already know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, so I'll, I'll look for some helpful um, metaphor or style or connecting putting together two ideas. In this case, um, it makes use of the kind of this, the octopus squid kind of thing as having some relationship to branches and trees. You know, and I don't think that people probably ever thought of a squid as being something that would convey a sense of time, but they're making the connection when they see this with trees and roots, I think, mm -hmm. you know, or conduits at least, you know, things moving through. Some people think a lot of mine look like intestines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But they, it's, what it still it's, means is it's this kind of a tube that's a, like a conduit for mm -hmm. something. And so the, our thinking about time is very much like something moving through space. Um, there's no real, I don't know, there's no real, it's just because we can't think of time in any other, other way that fits into a two-dimensional image. Is it is it, it moves along maybe from the bouncing ball on the the screen you know, or yeah. or but but anyway so wherever it came from it's I don't know but it's still well understood so people can and that's that's the beginning of telling a story and that's how that's my job that's if it was gonna if you were gonna say um, if you wanted me to, to to say the thing that I try to do the most the thing that I try to to, to not lose sight of is that I'm uh, telling a story with these things that I have. Uh, I want you to come away with an understanding of what I said, and I 
am more interested in that you get it than in that it's a perfect storytelling that it has to be compelling it has to draw you in and leave you with an understanding I don't believe that there you know when you move from one media to the to the next or you just just thought and thinking and understanding you're always losing something so the point is, is um, that I want to make my choices based on uh, a communicative idea rather than a um, for instance science it's it's important to keep the data clean you know and to, and to not put anything in there or throw anything away that will corrupt uh, the tracing back mm -hmm. of a, so that it has a, there's the methodology has to be um, repeatable and, and clean where bio, mine has to be compelling and informative you know and understandable so it's difference you know and um, so the ver a lot of the places spaces diagrams um, use a different set of standards than I do and I, that's because they come out of um, a more rigorous um, or I say let's just say a different rigorous um, discipline where um, the methodology can't be corrupted, and storytelling um, corruption can work in your favor. I mean, as long as as long as you 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 because what you're following is not is not uh, connected directly to the um, to the world. It's, it's it's corrected to the it's connected to the understandings. You know, like you're that that's 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 the uh, the ultimate uh, judgment is based on does it work in people's minds? Not does it, is it an accurate reflection of as something that's on the ground, mm -hmm. so it's just a bit different. I mean, we hope they would all line up in the long run, but but um, in fact, they, none of them actually line up. That's just the job of science and and storytellers is to try and get it so that we're better lined up. But in, in the end, they're not. Peter Glor. I'm a research scientist at the MIT Center for Collective Intelligence in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I'm also the chief creative officer of software company Galaxy Advisors, which is the developer of the tool Condor. It is headquartered in Switzerland, where I'm recording this video right now. In the next five minutes, I will be very happy to show you the features of Condor. Condor makes sense of large amounts of interaction data. It analyzes data on three levels. On the global level, on the organizational level and on the individual level. On the global level, it takes data from the internet, through the Google Search API, from blogs and web pages, Facebook data, it takes Twitter data, it takes Wikipedia data and constructs social networks and um, semantic networks. It takes organizational data, mostly through email, but also through Yammer, and other organizational interaction archives to look at what organizations are doing. And then it also takes individual data, small team data of people interacting with each other and collecting the data through sociometric batches that people wear around their necks. Condor has a series of fetches that collect the data. Um, it has an email fetcher that behaves like an email client, it has a Facebook fetcher that collects the Facebook network. It has a web search fetcher that through the Google search API takes links between web pages and contents of web pages. It has a Twitter fetcher that takes data from the Twitter search API and streaming API. And it has a Wikipedia fetcher which constructs Wikipedia networks based on the link structure of Wikipedia pages and then loads all of this into a MySQL database. Let's now look at Condor in action. I'm starting Condor from the command line and it's now um, initializing the MySQL database connection. I have to log in into my database, which I'm doing right now into my local server. Now I open first a database and Inside a database, I can have different um, data sets 
I'm taking right now a database which I have already preloaded for my own mailbox. And inside that database, I open one particular data set with uh, some emails that I have also already loaded. And when I open the data set, I have the option of filtering down by date, selecting a shorter time range, or I can filter by content, uh, further restricting the emails I'm loading. I can also restrict the numbers of people I'm loading. In this case, I'm taking everybody. And now I have the um, static view um, that I'm opening up first. It will show me the social network. So I'm making a little bit more space here on both sides. I'm zooming out a little bit. I can now calculate a series of network metrics through the annotate function. I can calculate between a centrality, degree centrality, closeness centrality, which I'm doing right now. I can now size by between a centrality, and that will tell me who the most important people are. Dragging the mouse over it. I'm the most central person here, it seems. I can color by domain name, for example. So we have this yellow org cluster here. We have the edu cluster for my mit.edu email address. And now I can also look at the content and calculate the sentiment. I can um, annotate by language. I'm taking here just the subject line, for example, and I'm adding emotionality and complexity. Condor has built in a series of languages, English, Spanish, French, German. And now I can look at the word cloud. And it will tell me who the most important words are. As this project is about UMI IBD, not surprisingly, that's the most central one. When I click on a certain word, I will get the word usage in the context. So we have 31 positive messages for the neutral and 11 negative about ones about UMI IBD. I could have done the same analysis for the content, not just the subject. I can also look at how um, things change over time. I can look at uh, sentiment over time, and it will tell me how positive or negative people were talking about a certain, in a certain time period here. I can add emotionality, and I could also look at the complexity of the language. There isn't much here. I can now go back and annotate also by contribution index, for example, which measures how much of a sender or a receiver somebody is. So here I'm now bringing up the actor scatter plot and looking at total messages sent and received on the x axis and contribution index which measures how much of a sender, that would be a one or a receiver minus one on the y-axis somebody is. I am here very much on the y-axis um, receiver because obviously I didn't include my send folder. So the most active person here is Sophia. And then there are other active people here dragging the mouse over it will tell me who they are. I could also look at how positive people are by looking at average sentiment. Then I would see that Sophia and Peter are pretty well balanced, slightly positive. 0.5 sentiment would be um, neutral. So we have a total of 420 messages and we are slightly positive. Here we have somebody who's extremely positive, but doesn't send so much emails, Sammy Kennedy. Finally, I'm looking at the dynamic movie, which I have to create first. So I'm calling up the dynamic view. I'm now just taking a time interval of always the last 60 days, and sliding that along the time axis from April 16th to June 19th, 2014. 
and it will now calculate the notes and now I can speed up the movie and just play it back and see what happens. This will tell me, and I'll also zoom out a little bit, when there is most action. I can stop the movie and size the notes by betweenness. I can again color the notes. Let's choose domain this time. And now it keeps on playing. And I will see when new people are joining and old ones are leaving. And we have here myself. In the center and other groups popping up, coming and leaving. I'm now looking at uh, another um, part of the uh, Infosphere. I am creating a new data set to look at some Twitter data about Crohn's disease. So I'm creating the data set first. And now I am calling up the Twitter fetcher and I will just collect the tweets about Crohn's that um, have been the last 2000 um, active or have been tweeted over the last 10 days. I will connect them with the search term and now it's calling up my tweets collecting them, inserting them into the database. And now I can look at them. I can just create a static view. And the big term in the center, I will annotate it again. I will first um, calculate between us. And if I size by between us, Let's see who the most central term is here, or I can also look at who is the most popular person, who has the most followers. And here we have those few people. We can look at what they are tweeting by just clicking on the line. And here is their tweet. So here, um, John is talking about teenage drinking in Massachusetts. We could again create movies, we could again look at content. So um, for now, let's just um, color here by um, where tweets are coming from. So here we have Eastern US, we have uh, London and so on. Condor. Now let's get back to what we can use Condor for. Condor has been developed for creating coins, collaborative innovation networks, uh, which means doing two things, cool hunting and cool farming. Cool hunting means finding the cool trends by finding the most influential people. And that's what we have seen. Cool farming means increasing collaboration between people and that's done by what we call virtual mirroring, which means showing the communication network, mirroring it back to the people that are involved into the communication. A key function of Condor is calculating the six honest signals of communication. It measures centrality of a person, how between or degree, um, the, what degree a person has, rotating leadership, how much the network position changes over time, measured as local maxima and minima in the betweenness curve. It measures honest sentiment, which measures positivity and negativity and emotionality of a person, a group and an entire network. It measures weighted variance in contribution index, how much of a sender or receiver somebody is. It measures how responsive somebody is, measured as average response time and number of nudges it takes. And it measures innovativeness of language, how influential somebody or a group is by using and introducing new words. Those six variables have high predictive capability and are then used in cool farming by first calculating the structure of a network, second measuring those six honest signals of communication, third 
calibrate the six honest signals of communication, for example, with a regression against a dependent variable, which is a performance metric of the network. And finally, coming up with recommendation of how one can improve the functioning or the performance or the creativity of a particular network. You can download Condor from guardian.galaxyadvisors.com slash guardian. After having signed up, you will get a trial key, which gets you um, Condor for two weeks. You can, if you are an academic, request a free academic license, or you can contact us for a commercial license. If you would like to know more about Condor, you will find a lot of information on um, the three in the three books swarm creativity cool hunting and cool farming and there is also an annual conference the next one next spring in tokyo where you will learn about a lot of uses of condor so please come join us and try condor out we would love to hear from So let's go now to my microscope so we can actually see what it looks like. So what you see here are energy pulses connecting the selected country, in this case the United States, um, to all the other countries where 10% um, of the mentions of one of those countries are shared with the other country. So what that means is, um, let's go here for a moment and let's pick a country like, say, um, Estonia. So if we click on Estonia, what it's doing now is it's saying every article in the first six months of last year that mentioned Estonia, what are all the other countries that were also mentioned in those articles? And so, and red outgoing means that more than 10% of the articles that mentioned Estonia um, also mentioned these other countries. Blue means that um, more than 10% of that country's, uh, of articles mentioning that country mentioned Estonia. So it's kind of giving you kind of a give and take. And here, of course, you can see that, you know, Estonia is most tightly connected with Europe. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, very, and, and what you're seeing here, the, um, the size of the dots and the volume of them coming out sure so, shows you the strength of those connections. So um, actually, if we kind of uh, come out here and we kind of look at this at an angle, um, you can see, of course, it's most tightly connected to Eastern Europe. So in the case of Estonia, it's very tightly connected to the other Baltic nations, very tightly connected to most of Europe, and of course, Russia. But now you see this time slider down here. This time slider lets us pick uh, what particular week we're interested in. So if we move this time slider all the way back here, You'll notice now in the first week, in the week of February 22nd, we'll notice there's this long arc down to Argentina. And you might say, well, that's kind of odd. You know, why is Estonia so tightly connected to Argentina in that week? And you'll notice if we move forward, it disappears. It was just really for that. Thank you very much for listening and watching. Um, hopefully, um has been uh, informative for you.